probably have a Yeah, I probably have well, I'll probably have both. Oh, yeah. So I have to actually ship it back to <laughs> um, a reminder for everyone joining us online, uh, we encourage you to join the online community behind NASA TweetUp and join the conversation with us. And you can do that at www.twitter.com slash NASA TweetUp, follow the NASA TweetUp and the Braille hashtags. Now, we're here for break. Now, as these two spacecraft are going to fly over the moon, they're going to you know, be flying over areas of greater and lesser gravity. It's their study the gravity field of the moon. And it's going to be they're, they're going to be moving apart based on the visible features and the masses hidden beneath the lunar surface. And these changes in velocity are going to allow scientists to create a high resolution map of the moon's gravity field. And that's amazing. That's cool. When I was learning, first learning about this mission, the thing that really stood out to me, and I just want to read this because I want to make sure I get it right, was that the onboard instruments will measure changes in the distance between the two spacecraft down to the diameter of a red bullet cell, which is a few microns. And I don't know about you, but for me, I had two parallel thoughts. First, clearly we live in the future. Um, <laughs> and, and second, you know, whose job is it to think that up? Whose job is it to work on this? And the exciting thing is you're going to get to meet a few of them today. Uh, we have a great program planned for you. A lot of speakers you're going to hear from some of the scientists, some of the engineers, people who will explain what they hope to learn about the moon from GRAIL and how that all advances the dream of space exploration and discovery for us. So we're going to jump right into it. Our first speaker, who runs NASA, <laughs> Charles Bolden, became the 12th NASA Administrator in July of 2009. As Administrator, he leads the NASA team and manages its resources to advance the agency's missions and goals. He is a retired Major General of the United States Marine Corps. His 34 years with the Marine Corps included 14 years as a member of the NASA's astronaut office. He's traveled to orbit four times aboard the space shuttle between 1986 and 1994, having commanded two of these missions. One of these was STS-31, the flight of Space Shuttle Discovery that deployed the Hubble Space Telescope. Please give a big grail speed of welcome to NASA Administrator Charlie Bolton. Thank you. I don't know whether this is supposed, is this supposed to work or not. This, am I holding it right or what do I do? That's all right. You all can hear me, though, right? We're good. We're good. Okay. You got it? Do I need it for TV? You're good. You're good. You're okay, you're good. If I'm hot, that's all right. How are you all doing? Good. I, I understand that if we were in flight, we'd probably be saying, Houston, we have a problem, or KSC, we have a problem, or I see some heads going like this. For those of you who have your own modem, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but we're having a little trouble with the wireless. Uh, I have this happen to me every time I come down here or I go anywhere. In my case, you know, I'm a Mac person, and so my Mac, my Mac sometimes, since I am, a, I am a Mac person because I carry one, 
not because I know how to do anything with it. <laughs> I have a five-year-old granddaughter who is my max, my max specialist. And so whenever I have a problem, if I'm back home, then, then one of my three granddaughters usually helps me out. But they're working on it, and hopefully for those of you who don't have your own modem, we'll be up and running and everything. But uh, I had the same problem this morning. I was over in the headquarters building here. So they got mine working, they'll get yours working. I want to thank you all for coming, first of all. And I know, anybody here from the UK? Is Kate here? No, but she said hi. Tell Kate I said hello. All right, I was asking as I came in. You know, Kate's become my very personal friend now, and uh, I don't want to get her in trouble or anything, but, but Kate is, is, she's sort of the person that I look at as emblematic of all of you. Somebody that's really, really, really enthusiastic about this, and, and actually serves as people that, tell our, that help us tell our story, because we can't do it alone. And having you here and having you take part in each of these activities, whether it's a launch of a, of a robotic spacecraft or a launch of a human spacecraft, and that's coming too, uh, quicker than you believe it or quicker than you know it, um, it's important that, that we have you here as a part of the NASA family. So thanks for coming. I know some of you travel for long distances uh, at your own expense many times, so we do appreciate that. Um, not sure if you've been through all the briefs on Grail, but uh, spent a little time with the folk from JPL and from here at, uh, who have been putting the vehicles together and everything, and they're excited. Uh, they were saying everything's looking really good, except for one thing that never looks really good here in Florida. Weather. Weather. It's the weather. Uh, but uh, any of you here for 135, for SDS 135, you remember how when we went out that morning, nobody expected us to launch? So the, the, the rule is, Never cancel on a forecast, okay? <laughs> if any of you are pilots, we learned that very early in your career. Never cancel on a forecast. Go get your dog on an airplane, uh, start up, taxi out, and yeah, you know, sometimes you'll make it and sometimes you won't. But as I told the team this morning, be patient. So for those of you who are here for the weekend or whatever it is, um, you know, be patient. We'll get off. Uh, hopefully it'll be in the morning. And, and the team is really excited. Uh, this is an incredibly important mission for us because it's really going to change our understanding of the moon. You know, it's our nearest neighbor, and although it's our nearest neighbor and humans have actually been there six times, uh, we don't know as much about it as we would like to. And GRAIL, the twin satellites <laughs> as they go around, uh, is going to do incredible work. Uh, and, and we're all excited about it. This will be uh, the next to the last launch, for a scheduled launch anyway, on a Delta II. So we've got another Delta II launch going out of Vandenberg in October. It's carrying a satellite called NPP. I don't know if any of you are planning to make the trip out there, but if you are and I can get out there, then I'll see you. So I see one hand anyway. And then we want you to be back here in November because we've got the biggest thing known to man, uh, sort of. Uh, when we launch Curiosity, the Mars Science Laboratory, that's going to be absolutely incredible. My whole Naval Academy class, I've been talking to them, you know, big class, 825 people. And uh, many of us are still alive. Uh, <laughs> old guys, but uh, it was interesting. Just the other day, they were thinking about it. They're looking for something to do. And because we have a, a, one of our classmates named Rich Benson works out at JPL, and I actually think Rich may have worked on MSL, then the class is getting kind of pumped about maybe having a class reunion down here in November. I think that would be a first for the Naval Academy if we could do that. So if any of you come back in November for MSL and you see a bunch of old guys, many of us with bellies hanging out and stuff like that, <laughs> and funky looking shirts that have you know Navy emblems on them or Navy hats or Marine Corps hats, you know it's the class of 68 from the Naval Academy. So if you have friends and family, tell them this will be the place to be in November because Curiosity is the largest vehicle we will have ever landed on another planet, and, uh, and it's gonna do incredible, incredible, incredible stuff. So we're really excited about it. Um, I have a special guest that I wanna bring in too, but I'm, I'm not gonna do it just yet, because I wanted to give you all an opportunity. I always try to take some questions if you have them. Uh, I don't know whether anybody has any, but if you do, Sing out, and I will try to answer. In fact, there's a mic so that we can do that. So you, you have a moment. We have some time. 
while you try to while we try to work on our wireless to see if we can get it up. Who came the longest? The farthest. Where'd you come from? Wow! <laughs> my my daughter-in-law is from Sydney. I'm originally from Sydney. Originally from Sydney. Ah, well, thank you. Who else is anybody else from the other way? Like the UK. The UK. All right. From Spain. Spain. Where? What part? Barcelona. Barcelona. Beautiful place. Yes. Yeah, I went there just to get on a ship to go cruise, and my wife and I said, "Why didn't we stay here?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we were passing through going that way and passing through coming back, and we keep saying we're going to go because my son was stationed in Madrid, and we spent several weeks there. Uh, so, but Barcelona is very beautiful. Who else from far away? Anybody from South Carolina? <laughs> <laughs> what part? Hey, my mother's birthplace. Did you grow up there? No, um, I actually grew up in Umatilla, Florida, um, but I've lived in Charleston for 22 years. Uh, Absolutely love it. And it's getting more and more beautiful every day. Yes, it is. Yeah, I agree. I'm from Columbia. You're from South Carolina also? Or are you just pumping your hand because <laughs> you got a signal? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let me start with the second, and uh, because it goes back to the first, what, you know, what would I like for my legacy to be? I want to know if there's life elsewhere in the universe. I do. Uh, one place that we think we'll get a hint, you know, at least in our, in our solar system anyway, is the planet Mars. And um, while I never dreamed of being an astronaut, I never dreamed of going to space, I always dreamed about, you know, finding life somewhere else in our universe. So if, if I could say what my lasting legacy was, was going to be, it would be that I left NASA in a position where we had plans and programs in place, uh, relatively well funded, that were gonna allow us to fly a series of robotic precursors to Mars and Jupiter and other places in the solar system that set us up to do what the president asked us to do, which is to have humans flying around Mars in the 2030s. I, you know, I won't be here as the next, it is, it goes without saying, 
I won't be the NASA administrator when that happens. But I would love to be able to walk out the door and say that everything's in place. Uh, everybody in America and around the world understands the plan. And whether they like it or not, uh, you know, okay, it makes sense. Don't know why they want to go there. But if they want to go there, I, I'm confident that they can do that. So, so that's sort of what I would like. The other thing I would like to do, and this has nothing to do with space flight, kind of. Um, I, I'm a pilot. And, and aeronautics is a passion for me, and I would love to also leave the agency with the budget for aeronautics on an upward trend where we get back to where we once were, uh, and we were the premier research and development organization in the world for aeronautics research. We, we kind of are. We do more basic aeronautics research than, than anybody around the world, but, but I would love for us to be acknowledged as the uh, you know the unchallenged uh, experts when it came to basic aeronautics research. So those two things. I, I hope that answers the question. Yes. Okay. I am a teacher. Hi. I am a teacher in Brooksville, Florida, and I wanted to ask just a really important question. And it was that students across our nation don't seem to know as much about space as they could. For example, they just go, okay, I know my very excellent mother just served us nachos or something, or nine pizzas. And some kids don't go beyond that at all. They go, okay, we have craters, or we have this, you know, and they, some kids don't even know that there are rings around planets besides Saturn. What do you want our next generation, such as like a 10-year-old, to learn about NASA and its vision in the next, I'd say, coming years. I don't know exactly how many to ask. One of the things we're doing right now in, 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 in trying to respond to the, the situation that you raise in your question, uh, we have something we call the Summer of Innovation. And it's, we just finished the second year of a three-year pilot where our focus is on middle school students and most importantly, their teachers. So what would I like to see? I'd like to see teachers, first of all, unafraid to step before a group of kids in a classroom, no matter what their subject matter is, and, and be unafraid of saying, let's talk about math and science a little bit. And let me explain to you why math is important and science is important, particularly somebody like uh, a music teacher who talks about, you know, uh, what do we do in this course that, do we need math? And have a kid shake their head saying, yes, we do because everything we do is octaves and it's eights. And so, you know, or uh, a writer, a writing teacher, explain why science or math is important, uh, because it really is. And, and we're really focusing on trying to equip teachers so that they have the confidence to stand in front of a class and talk to kids about math, science, engineering, technology. The other thing is, um, you know, most of you probably know what an engineer is. We have some teachers in the US who if you ask them what an engineer is or an engineer does, they'll tell you it's the guy in the front car on a train. <laughs> and, I, and I don't say that as a joke. And so in America, the, you know, what we should be the leaders in the world when it comes to science and technology. We need to have our people understand what engineering is, what engineers do, whether they want to be one or not. But those are some of the things that I think we have to do. Right here, then there, then. You want to give it to him? A little bit. We'll do you, you, and then. Uh, congressional funding is obviously a very tricky game, uh, for, for lack of a better word. Um, and, and it's very hard to, you know, understandably get funding when people don't necessarily understand what you're trying to do, or you're not even sure what you're trying to do, and they want you to commit to something ahead of time. And what is the best thing that we, as, as fans of, of NASA and the space program, can do to help you? I think the best thing you can do is continue to do what you do right now. You know, um, I tell people all the time, don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to do something else. Do the thing that you do very well and you enjoy. This is incredible. The messages that you are able to get out across the world uh, is absolutely incredible. The number of people that you will reach this afternoon uh, as you go from speaker to speaker. And, you know, to be able to tweet to the rest of the world that Maria Zuber just told me that the reason, the way that the gravimetric 
measurements from these twin satellites can tell us about the interior, the core of the moon is, and the NASA administrator didn't know that. That's okay. No, no, that's okay. Because the NASA administrator should not know everything. I have very, very smart people that I try to lead. I, I have, I, you know, I'm proud to say, people ask me a lot, uh, do I like my job? I love my job. And I love it because I happen to be with some of the most phenomenal people in the world. And, uh, and it, I'm very proud to go places and talk about them and what they do. So do what you are doing right now. Uh, given an opportunity to talk to a congressman or a congresswoman or a senator when they come to your town, uh, ask them you know, what they think about space and is it important. Uh, some of them will say, sure it is. It's really critical. Some of them will say, I don't have a clue. But at least they're being honest. I, the thing that I think you know, I tell people a lot, I, one of the things that makes me happiest about working for President Obama is that he has at least forced uh, the public dialogue. Now we don't, we're not having it as much as we should have, but, but you know, we need to talk about what's important to our nation and what it is that we want as our national legacy. Do we want to be known as the foremost science and engineering country in the world, or do we want to let some other country do that? So I think you all are helping us get that message out by doing what you're doing today. Question right there. And I'm only gonna, I, I, I wish I could stay forever, but I'm gonna introduce a special guest and then I've gotta go, because I've gotta go find out about money. <laughs> I have a telephone this afternoon back to Washington to find out about the money. Huh? Tell them to give me a lot. Tell them to give me a lot. Dave, you got that message? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> um, right now, obviously, NASA's starting to um, wind down the shuttle program, starting to encourage a lot of uh, private companies developing launch systems and other SpaceX. Uh, you know, there are others. Um, has NASA looked at uh, the idea of, of by similar kind of efforts, um, in particular with the moon, for prospecting or that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and also dealt with things like you know, potential ownership rights or, or things like that. We aren't looking at the second, the second part he asked about was ownership rights of places like the moon or other things. But what we are doing is we are, we are in support of organizations like uh, uh, Google Lunar XPRIZE, where I forget what the award is, but a significant amount of money for the first private citizen or group that can actually fly something to the moon, land it. And does anybody know what, do they have to return or is it just land? Do you remember? <laughs> Drive around? Yeah. yeah. yeah no, okay. But, but, you know, we're a supporter and I think that's, that's really important. Um, things like that are really important if for the only reason that they inspire you know, humans, people to, to want to explore and to try things that others might think are impossible. Um, so I, I think it's really important. I, I will tell you, let me ask a question here because this is a really smart group. Somebody tell me, okay, there is no American capability to get a human or cargo to orbit right now, to the International Space Station. How many years before we have restored that capability. Who knows? 2014? Well, 2014, cargo, cargo this year, right? Oh, you're smart. See, I got the right answer already. <laughs> we are actually, the, she's got the right answer already. And, and the answer is, we're monks. <laughs> <laughs> this is your job? No, I need a job. Oh, you need a job. Okay. <laughs> hey. start hiring again. But she's absolutely right. We are months away from having a domestic capability to take cargo to the International Space Station. It is critically important that we be able to do that if for no other reason than as was pointed out in the last month, uh, you know, we have an incredibly reliable partner in the Russians, but even they have failures now and then. And so we want to be in, we want to be at a point where we have reliable, redundant access to space. When people say, why do we need commercial capability to take people and, and cargo to space? We need reliable, redundant access to space for both humans and cargo. So it's really, really important. And we're months away from being able to have maybe two of the two companies actually taking cargo to the International Space Station for hire. Uh, SpaceX is scheduled to fly their last one or two 
sort of demonstration flights in November, December time frame, and then orbital will shoot fly one in December, January-ish, and then after that, they're off and they're flying for hire. So that's gonna happen. I wish I could answer more questions, but I, I, they got, they're getting ready to drag me out of here. But let me, let me introduce a very, very dear friend of mine, somebody who, um, you know, you can be inspired by somebody and still chicken out. Uh, the person I'm going to introduce to you, that you all know, is Lieutenant Uhura. Uh, <laughs> Michelle Nichols, you know, but before she gets here, I'll tell you, I watched her as she recruited or tried to recruit women and minorities for the astronaut program for NASA. And I watched her, and I believed everything she said, but I chickened out. And so I did not apply for the first group of astronauts. And I, I told her that, but I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't stop watching her, and I still haven't stopped watching her. <laughs> <laughs> so allow me to introduce Michelle Nichols. <laughs> Michelle Nichols, you are really. Uh, what he did was very smart because nobody believed that uh, I was going to be able to be successful in recruiting the first woman and minority astronauts for the space shuttle program because when they came to me there were already, already uh, four or five months underway for um, uh, the recruitment drive and um, Nobody had applied that was qualified. Women stayed away in droves. Black people stayed away in droves. Yellow people stayed away in droves. Green people stayed away. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they were staying on, so it looked like we were going to have an all white male uh, astronaut corps again. And they were very concerned about it because this was the next. One was going to be for the first space shuttle program. And so when they came to me to ask me to assist them, I said, oh no, you're not going to get me killed. Uh, <laughs> my folks are all, all saying that NASA is not serious, and I'm not coming to, to help NASA, uh, who's going to be approved uh, one more time to not be serious. And they said, we're very, very serious, Michelle. And I knew this man, John Yardley, from working with him for a, a, a years ago. And I knew he was a man of honor. So I let him uh, talk me into it. But I said, John, if I go out and I'm going to get you the top people, I'm not getting just, just um, bachelor degrees, which is the lowest that, that, that they'll take. I'm going to get you people not only PhDs, but you higher, higher um, uh, uh, degrees. I'm going to get people you cannot turn down. And if you turn around and it happens again, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> <laughs> I will be your worst nightmare. I am going next week to speak at Congress, before Congress, and then I'll go back again. I'm going to speak about the importance of the space program and our lives in it, and you're going to have me recruiting and then nothing's going to happen. He, and he said, um, you're going to go before Congress and tell them what happened that we didn't? I said, yes. And he stood up and put out his hand and said, and I'll go with you. I knew I had a serious man there. And the, the administrator had just walked in the room, uh, and, and uh, he walked over and put his hand on top. Uh, four months later, I got them, I went on every television show, newspaper, tel radio station, covers of magazines, and big mar uh, articles. Um, and it wasn't because I was so smart, I was Lieutenant Uhura. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I never told a lie. <laughs> As Uhura. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I went to people, 
personally, and I went to, I, oh, it just happened that when I came aboard, every, the organization of black engineers and, and, um, and the, 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 the Latino newspapers, and everyone would listen to me and they'd go, I feel sorry for you, Michelle. It's not gonna happen. And I said, it's gonna happen. When I finished four months and five months later, four and a half months later, NASA had about, in all, a thousand, uh, a hundred uh, uh, recruit, um, applications of people who wanted to go and write about it, who wanted to go and see what it felt like to be an astronaut. And I said, that's not what I'm looking for. And I went to universities and the universities I went to, I didn't go actually go to the universities to recruit university students. I wanted the presidents to identify the graduates and the PhDs that came from them. That's how, that's who I went to. I went to organizations that were having their conventions and I convinced them that at least I was serious and that NASA was serious and they laugh and I said keep laughing and find me the people that I need and I take that laughter we'll be laughing a different way with joy and that's what I did and four months later I had 5,000 over 5,000 applications and they had to choose these people because they got chose six women, albeit they were all white at that time, three African American men, an Asian, and American indigenous uh, uh, human being from this before we ever got here, an Indian. So um, it became, and they chose them, and I didn't have to go to um, Congress. <laughs> and I became an advocate. I became a believer, and so did NASA. And that's where my uh, relationship with NASA grew, and that's why I know that nothing is impossible. If you can imagine it, if you can dream it, you can do it. It's gotta be done, it will be done, and so it is. Thank you all. It's been wonderful being here with you. <laughs> um, no, he's fantastic. He's, he's the deputy director of the Planetary Science Division in NASA headquarters. I mean, essentially, he's responsible for the day-to-day -day program management of the missions. Uh, that's things like the cost, the schedule, the technical performance on all the planetary missions uh, that are, you know, continue to conduct just outstanding uh, science and, and make new discoveries that keep us all in awe. Basically, he keeps the trains running. Uh, awesome guy on Twitter. NASA Jim. Jim Adams. <laughs> Great. How do you follow Charlie Bolden and Michelle Nichols? <laughs> what you do is you tell Jim Adams to get out of the way because you want to hear from Neil deGrasse Tyson. Right? <laughs> so um, I had uh, just a couple of random thoughts to start with, and then we'll just open it up to questions. Uh, one of the things is I'm a pilot, and when I was in flight school, <clears throat> I'm not as good a pilot as Charlie, by the way. When I was in flight school, I was trying to explain to my wife about lift. And as soon as I did this, her eyes rolled in the back of her head, and I knew the moment was over. And so this, in my family, means whatever. Okay. So when Maria does that, try not, never mind. Okay. So, and I will let Maria explain how the two gra gravity probes, Grail, make these just outrageous measurements 
Uh, there is a little bit of black science in it, but it's not the first time it's been done. The GRACE mission around the Earth has been measuring gravity changes in, uh, around the Earth for many years now. And uh, so it's, a, it's actually quite a well-known science, and it's, uh, it's going to tell us amazing things about the internals of the, of the moon. Um, the thing about planetary science that I find the most compelling is that it's part of what every human being does. Every human being is searching for his or her place in the universe. And the three things that we're focused on in planetary science is answering some major big questions like, how did we get here? Where are we going? And are we alone? And I love the fact that Charlie wants to be the administrator, that when he walks out the door, the stage is set to find life in our solar system or find life beyond, because we really believe it's out there. And how will that change our worldview? How will that change our view of ourselves and our place in the universe when we find it? These are things that you need to be thinking about because it could happen in your lifetime. And so I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here and willing to engage the public with your social media so that we can get the message out. Uh, GRAIL happens to be the second of three launches in what we've been calling the year of the solar system, just an absolutely incredible year. We started in November with an encounter of the comet Hartley 2. In February, on Valentine's Day, we encountered the comet Temple 1 for the second time. And after a two billion dollar, uh, two billion mile, sorry, not that one, <laughs> two billion mile journey, the spacecraft Messenger went into orbit around Mercury in March. Dawn, we launched from Kennedy Space Center on a Delta II in September of 2007. In July, got to the asteroid Vesta, just some outstanding imagery from there. And then just last month, we launched Juno on its five-year journey to Jupiter. And tomorrow, because I'm a positive thinker, <laughs> we will send Grail off to the moon to measure the moon from crust to core. And then like Charlie said, in November, the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover flies to Mars and uh, in a nine month journey, then in August of next year, we'll land on the surface of Mars and explore it in ways that we've never been able to even dream about. And in fact, my boss Jim Green and I have a steak dinner bet on whether or not the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover will measure a certain isotope of methane. The reason is, that methane is in that particular isotope is an indicator of a existent life on the planet Mars. And so the question is, is it there or isn't it? And I'll probably lose. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. It's, uh, let's see. Uh, did you have fun today? Yeah. Yes. That's good. Did you get out to the Delta Pad, Complex 17? Yeah. yeah. 300 and 55 Delta launches from that complex. Started in 1960, not with Delta IIs, but with Delta Series. It's a historic pad. I hope you had a good time. I hope everything is, is going well for them. You know, the thing I think about the space shuttle is an awesome sight to watch a space shuttle take off. How many have seen that? Yeah. Changed your life, didn't it? Mm. It did, I hear that all the time. It, it is a, it's just an, it's just a earth-shaking, rumbling experience. And an Atlas V is similar. If you watch that, uh, the Atlas V 51 take off on Juno, it, it leaped off the pad with authority and pushed Juno on to, to Jupiter. But in all my career, I have never seen a rocket launch more beautiful, more graceful than a Delta II like you're going to see tomorrow. Delta II is like a tall lady, gently pushing her babies off into space. <laughs> so I, I hope you enjoy the, the Delta II launch tomorrow, and I hope you tell people about it. Because it's the inspiration factor that will tell the kids of tomorrow what they should be doing so that we can sustain a space program in this nation. In a, in a political environment where 
initiatives come and go every four years, or sometimes every two years. The space program needs stability. It needs a long-term objective that people who follow us can buy into. And that requires people that are children today to be inspired for tomorrow. And so you guys and social media play an enormous role in that. The teachers in this room, how many teachers do we have in this room? Fantastic, I think it's just a wonderful you guys are here. You guys are on the front lines of that initiative. And so thank you for being here. Um, one of the things I thought I'd do is just talk real quickly about the power of social media. <clears throat> Um, the statistics are a little hard to understand, but the best statistic that we have for measuring impact is something called potential impressions. And Trent tells me, where's Trent? Is around somewhere. Yes, Trent tells me that potential impressions is used in the print industry as well. But um, at the Juno tweet up, there were 150 tweeters and 28,000 tweets that went out as a result of the tweet up. But then those got picked up and retweeted and moved off to other, other locations and that sort of thing. Ultimately, there were 90.7 million potential impressions. That's the power of social media. That doesn't mean that there were 90.7 million people that actually read about Juno. But what it means is that there was a wave of public awareness of how Juno and the space program. And we owe that to social media. The other interesting thing I, I just think is remarkable, one day on Twitter, I didn't have anything to do, so I found myself trying to compose a 140 character haiku or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I said, I wonder how hard it would be for somebody to put together a website so you could log like a guest book or like a wedding register that you watched the Juno launch. And in an afternoon, somebody did it. You know, if I had wanted to do that in the government, <laughs> Juno would be over before we got that website approved. And so that actually got some legs. It was called iwatchjuno.launch.com or something like that. And um, it actually confirmed that there were people on every continent that watched Juno launch. Um, but that got legs, and I think that's fantastic. And so someone else's, or maybe it was the same person, picked it up, and they have now got a website that they want to keep going. And so I would encourage you to go there. It's called launchwatch.org. So if you watch Grail launch, whether you watch it here in person or online, Go register the fact that you did so. And then you can go back in time in a few years and remember the time that you had here at the Grail tweet up at Kennedy Space Center. Do I have time for questions? Got time for a, for a few questions. Oh, great. No questions. Excellent. Questions? <laughs> You were talking about how um, we should be sharing a lot about Grail or our followers. And one of my followers actually wanted to know, and, and me too, how can we get people more excited about these unmanned launches? Um, I was here for, for the shuttle launches. I saw the coast, it was you know, full of people watching. And um, I was reading some articles recently that talked about just how powerful um, technology we get from unmanned launches, like Grail, like Juno. So how can we like, get people more involved and excited about this? Well, everybody gets excited about different things. Some of you will get excited about the way the Earth rumbles and the roof shakes when, when the rocket takes off. Other people will get excited about the economic potential of being able to mine asteroids someday. And other people will get, get excited, like me, about finding their place in the universe. And frankly, what you need to do is engage those people in conversation. What is it that excites you? And what is it that you can see of yourself in the nation's space program? Because, frankly, I've never met a person that can't. There's enough of what we do in space that can encourage everybody. And when we have a launch success, everybody in this nation and really on this globe is part of that success because they're part of the human race. So I would, my, my suggestion is talk. 
talk to people, inform people, and that's what you guys do best. So, you had a question. Um, do you think that the ways are going to ever end up Oh, wow. We should ask Lieutenant O'Hara that question. <laughs> should, would the Voyagers ever end up in the hands of another civilization? You know, I really don't know. But what I can tell you is the half-life of the radioisotope power system on board is 88 years, and it's now roughly halfway through its half-life. Um, pretty soon, it's going to get so far out beyond the edge of our solar system, you know it's reached the heliopause now. Right? Uh, that we won't be able to build an antenna big enough to actually listen to it. But that's, uh, that's still an amazing feat of engineering. And wouldn't it be cool if somebody, someday somebody found it, prepared it, and sent it back? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah. So one quick question um, for those who haven't seen your talk here Space Center, you mentioned that there are three missions right now in the running to be selected. One to Titan, one to Mars for seismic, and one to a comet top around and gather a sample. When will we know which one is chosen and you know, where can people go to learn about those and see what's upcoming? Uh, that's a good question. Um, what, what happened, remember I mentioned here the solar system. Here the solar system here. Um, in, uh, in NASA parlance and planetary science parlance is the 26 month period starting in November of last year. You can't answer this question because you already know, but why is the year of the solar system 26 months? It's a Mars year, Doug, you knew that too, right? Yeah, it's that 26 months is a Mars year, right? But it starts with, it started with the encounter of Hartley 2 and will end when we successfully land the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. And it begins that fantastic journey. But we have to plan for the future. Things take time to develop. And we will be going through this same intense sort of period, this peak in planetary science in 2015 and 2016. One of the things that Sarah was just referring to is the, the next discovery selection. So what will that be? The way we do that is we ask for proposals. We got 28 proposals. We down selected to three potential candidates. One is a fantastic opportunity to understand what's going on inside of Mars with a seismic mission. Another is a journey to the surface of a comet that would then look inside the comet from different angles. It would actually look here and then hop off and go over there and then hop off and go over there. The third is a journey to the largest moon in the solar system, Titan. Now, Titan has a hydrological cycle. You remember that, right? Uh, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and accumulation. Except it's not water on Titan. On water, it rains liquid methane. And we've been able, through Cassini, to watch lake beds fill up in the southern hemisphere of Titan. And so the third mission is some just really outrageous folks have thought of this idea to put a boat on Titan in one of those methane lakes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? So I think we're just about, oh, I'm not getting the hook quite yet. Go ahead. I just had a fanciful question. Who would row that boat? Um, well, I got one from my kids back in New York. How can we get more kids interested? And I guess a follow-up to that would be, how does math factor in to what we're talking about here? They're always asking that. So. Math factors. Let's see. Would that be? Uh, boy, it was a long time since I did any factoring. Anyway. Don't tell them that. No. <laughs> The, the bottom line is math is extremely important. In fact, if you, if you don't study algebra, you're not setting the right path. In my mind, you're not setting the right path for yourself. And I say this to kids all the time. Study algebra. You're not setting the right path for yourself, regardless of whether you go into science or mathematics. You're not setting the right path for yourself if you don't study algebra, if you end up being an artist or a poet. 
Math is extremely important for your ability to understand the world around you and to be able to analyze that. And so that's the second question. The first question is how can we? I come back to the same answer I gave before. Those of us that get it need to tell others. And it can't just be the government's job. It's got to be the job of every person and every one of you in this room I would challenge to pick three or four people to make sure that you tell about what's going on in space and how they can be involved in the future. If your purpose originally, you mentioned about Mars and finding life using the isotopes of methane. Yes. If your purpose is to find extraterrestrial life, why not go somewhere where you might have the possibility, such as Europa, where below the ice there could be living organisms? So, so Europa is on my is on my list, and it, and actually it's part of the steak dinner bet I have with my boss. <laughs> They, what I was describing were the three candidates that we had selected for the discovery competition and which I really didn't answer her question, which was, when will we make that choice? The answer is May, summer time frame of next year. So we give them time to flesh out their concepts and worry about the risks and that sort of thing. But yes, Mars isn't the only place. In fact, my boss Jim Green points out that wherever you go on the Earth, you could go, 100 miles deep into the soil, and if you pull up even the slightest amount of water, there is life there. And so his point is, there's, he believes that the solar system is teeming with life. I'll tell a story. I was uh, at uh, a focus group. We were trying to come up with this uh, new theme, and we eventually arrived on new worlds, new discoveries. But we tested it in a couple of areas. And in Sacramento, I had the chance to talk to this one group, and, and the facilitator had said, you know, is, is what NASA does important to you? And they all said, yeah, of course it's, it's important to us. And then um, he said, well, how about, um, how about finding life in our solar system? Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And, um, and did you know about Europa? And so he told them a little about Europa. And this is all going on. I'm behind a glass screen. It's kind of a blind test. They didn't actually know why they were coming and all that kind of stuff. And so. Finally, um, you see, he had a big consensus saying, yeah, finding life at Europa would be a really big deal. And then he said to, to the audience, he said, well, what if I told you it was algae? And one girl piped up and said, well, then I'm not interested. You've got to bring me a puppy. <laughs> I, I maintain that whether it's algae or a puppy or worms or green slime, um, that it will change our understanding of who we are in the universe. And so Europa is a rich spot for that sort of thing. It's also very difficult to get to. So, um, I, I'm getting hooked, right? No? Are we done? No. We've got, got a few more minutes? Do one more question. One more question. There we go. <laughs> Lots of boats coming in. Space boat. <laughs> Last time I said, don't tweet that. That's the first thing everybody did. <laughs> Hi. You talked about engaging people. And it, it's my feeling that it needn't be anything difficult or complicated. And I'm wondering what you're thinking. For me, it's as simple as standing out on my front lawn with my telescope or waiting for the ISS to fly over and engage joggers who look at me wondering what I'm doing. <laughs> I think, you know, that's, those are fantastic suggestions. There's a wonderful uh, Twitter account that you can follow called Twist that will tell you when the space station is due to fly over you. And, um, and to have a space station watching party, um, I have not ever found anybody that wasn't interested in going out and looking for the space station in the sky and thinking about the fact that there are people in that little dot flying overhead. I think you're right. I think you have to be passionate about space and then just let it rub off on people. And, and eventually, we will raise a generation of active 
space aware people that will continue the agenda and live the dream. Right. Geophysics and head of the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at MIT. She's been involved in more than half a dozen NASA planetary missions aimed at mapping the Moon, Mars, Mercury, and several asteroids. Please uh, give a warm welcome to Principal Investigator Marie Zuber. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming out. God, I didn't know what to expect here, but uh, what, a, what a remarkable group of people here. And just, I've been just sitting in the back for the last several minutes, and uh, you know, I'm just uh, drawing a lot of energy from you people because I don't have too much energy left myself. And, uh, my day starts at 10 o'clock tonight, so. Uh, so uh, let's see, I've, I've got some charts here, and uh, is it possible to get the lights down in the room a little bit so that uh, we can see those? Is that within the realm of possibility? So. Um, I was gonna give you an overview of, uh, of the science of the, the mission and tell you. So, uh, you know, uh, I've answered a lot of questions this week. Um, we sent uh, 109 spacecraft to the moon. Um, 12 people have walked on the moon. They've brought back samples of rocks. Uh, what on earth do we need another moon mission for? Um, well, um, my passion, my personal passion, is to try to understand uh, how planets formed and evolved. Okay? I, uh, and I have, uh, growing up, looked at the planets, looked at the surface of the planets, through my telescope, planetary images, for hours and hours and hours, and I can just look at planetary surfaces and try to go back and reconstruct in my mind what made a planet like it is today. It's a little bit like uh, recreating the crumb, okay, uh, uh, detective story. And, um, and for that, um, we have orbital information from the moon. We've had a variety of uh, spacecraft that have orbited the moon that have taken fabulous images, that have taken the spectra from which, which we've inferred composition um, have told us about different elements that occur on the moon. Uh, and then, from the lunar samples, the lunar samples are just a tremendous treasure. Uh, those samples were brought back 40 years ago now. They are still being analyzed today with new generations of instrumentation and remarkable discoveries about the moon are still occurring uh, from the lunar samples. And um, and so uh, here, so in, um, you know, those of you who went through Apollo, I, I got to stay up late to watch the Apollo astronauts on the moon. And, um, and now I still work with the data that was brought back uh, from those missions, and I'm still learning a great deal uh, about the moon. And so Jack Schmidt calls uh, Apollo samples the gift that keeps on giving, uh, because uh, we still are learning so much about it. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Okay, well there's, this is how we think the moon formed, okay? It's, uh, it's a little bit washed out there, but our, our view of how the moon formed is that uh, um, a planet about the size of Mars made a strafing hit um, on the Earth, and the core of the impactor wrapped itself around the Earth's core, and the mantle of the Earth and the mantle of the impactor was thrown off uh, into, uh, into a disk. The Earth melted, uh, the material in orbit melted, vaporized. And then if we could go to the next, uh, next slide. It should show a disk, I think, okay? Okay, um, I hope you guys can see this better than me. Not really. Not really. We'll put these online too, so they'll be able to access them. 
So um, if you could see it, <laughs> you can use your imagination here. Okay. Uh, we have the Earth. The Earth has a, a disk uh, around it. Okay. And out of that disk forms the moon. The moon accretes and forms. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. A suggestion had recently come up that perhaps two moons form. Uh, a paper came out in Nature about uh, three weeks ago that suggested maybe that uh, the two moons form. And we'll, we'll talk about that second. Um, but then, um, so the moon uh, accretes. At least the outer parts of the moon are completely uh, melted, and it's something we call uh, the lunar magma ocean. All those white parts of the moon that you see in the front. Uh, that's a, it's a mineral called uh, plagioclase feldspar, which is a, a silicate mineral, and, um, and it's got aluminum in it and silica and oxygen, but it hasn't got uh, iron and magnesium, which are heavy, so those sink. Um, the the plagioclase rises. I call it like a scum on a pond. Okay? Mm -hmm. It rises to the surface, and then the moon starts to cool off. Okay? And uh, let's see, next, uh, next slide. Boy, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, well, I can still tell the story, though. <laughs> um, so uh, the moon starts to cool off, but there's uh, debris left over from the accretion of the planets. And that debris, uh, as the moon cools off, it starts to impact the moon and forms large impact bases. And on the near side, there are a number of uh, huge impact basins, and they've been flooded with uh, lava, gigantic lava flows. And these are the dark areas that we see on the moon. Okay. So what's what's interesting about that is uh, if you look at the far side of the moon, you don't see these big dark areas like you see on the near side of the moon. And uh, and this is this is a very fundamental thing about the moon. Why is the near side of the moon that we see, different from the far side of the moon that we don't see. And uh, here we are, we've sent 109 missions to the moon and, uh, and six sets of astronauts to bring back samples. And we don't know why the front and the back of the moon are different. Okay. Um, very fundamental. Um, we used to think that, uh, okay, well obviously on the near side there was melting beneath the surface and that melted uh, lava came to the, the surface. Uh, we used to think that the far side of the moon was melted underneath too, and the lava, as it rose up, there weren't the big basins there um, that uh, uh, were able to uh, um, fill. So you never, the magma was there, but it never got itself up high enough because there were no big holes. But now we know from measuring the topography of the moon that the back side of the moon has a, an impact basin that's way bigger and way deeper than anything on the near side that doesn't have these lava flows. And, um, and so, and if you can see the next slide, it will be mm. on the next slide, but trust me, okay, because these are gonna go online, so you can call me on it. Um, well, there it is, okay, so, um, so, so you see down there in the, the lower right-hand corner, that's the, the biggest uh, crater on the back side of the moon. It's about two-thirds the size of the United States. It's called the South, the South Pole Aiken Basin, and it's uh, eight kilometers deep. So. If there was magma there, it would have flooded the crater. So clearly, the near side of the inside of the moon underwent melting, the far side didn't, and, um, and we don't know why that occurred. Okay, now, I wanna talk about the, the second moon, or the lunar companion, okay? You see that uh, white area there on the, uh, the back of the, the moon? Okay, so that's an elevation map, and the white is uh, high. The white and red are high, and the blue and the purples are low. So, um, so the idea uh, behind um, the, uh, the these highland areas. So, some people thought that it was material ejected from that crater, except that would be ballistic trajectories, and a lot of that would have been lost from the moon. So, we don't know what a good idea that was. But uh, one idea that uh, was published very recently is that. Um, not one moon formed out of that disk around the Earth, but two moons formed out of that disk around the Earth, okay? And they were both formed from the same disk, 
So they both have the same composition. Okay. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. Okay. Now this, uh, the, well, after the moon forms, the moon formed very close to Earth and immediately it started receding. And the material inside the disk it either impacts Earth or it gets perturbed out of the system and it clears out the disk pretty rapidly. Uh, but if another moon formed in the same orbit around the Earth that our moon was in, okay, it's actually something called the Trojan points. Some of you may have heard of the Trojan asteroids around Jupiter. Um, it's a stability point in front and uh, behind the primary there. Um, that actually a, this moon could have been stable for a while. This second moon would have been about a third of the size as, uh, as our moon. And because it's in the same orbit, it would eventually drift towards the moon, but it would do it at a very low velocity. And in fact, when it hit our moon, um, it would hit it below the subsonic as opposed to what we call hypervelocity impacts. So hypervelocity impacts make craters. They make shockwaves and planets. They eject material. It's very dramatic. Um, but if it were to happen at a low velocity uh, relative to the moon, it actually adds material onto it. more material than the moon and it rejects. So you can actually make a mountain rather than a crater if you did this. And so when the authors of this paper, when they did their simulation, they actually made uh, specific predictions uh, of what the Grail mission could measure that would, that would tell us whether or not this idea for the far side lunar islands um, is uh, is due to uh, is due to a second uh, collision. So those are the kind of things uh, that we want to try to understand. Um, another thing that we want to try to understand is the nature of the moon's core, uh, assuming it has one. We think the moon has a core. Now, um, what's interesting: the core of the Earth is about half the radius of the Earth, whereas the moon's core is very tiny if it exists. Okay. The thought is that it was probably an iron core. The thought is that it has a slight liquid molten outer core. But we don't know this for sure. So the Apollo astronauts had seismometers that they left. Um, the moon is very dissipated mm -hmm. in the interior. They didn't get a good view of deep inside the moon. There are some suggestions of a core, but there are also reflections on the seismograms that are just as prominent as the ones that are being interpreted or that nobody's interpreting. So, so it's right at the level of where the signal to noise is about one. And so, uh, so there's a great deal more that we need to know about the heat and tear of the moon. There's, there's no particular reason uh, that the moon must have an iron core. Um, uh, it could have a titanium oxide core. There's a lot of titanium on the moon. So when the outside of the moon was molten, this magma ocean, um, in, uh, the heavy heat producing elements, heavy elements like titanium, would sink. And uh, some models indicate that they could keep sinking and falling all the way um, to the center of the moon. So maybe there's an iron core, maybe there's a titanium oxide core, maybe there's an iron core with this uh, magma ocean dregs and material on top of it. It's possible that the, the deep interior of the moon is very complex. And mapping that out and studying it uh, will tell us a lot about the deep interior of the moon. So those are some of the scientific uh, questions that we want to try to um, address with the GRAIL mission. And, uh, and to sort of summarize here, um, we will use this exceptionally high quality gravity data um, that we're going to get. And um, we will interpret this along with uh, the many observations that we've taken from remote sensing of lunar orbiters and of the Apollo samples, which are continuing to be analyzed. And from all of that information together, uh, we are going to be able to provide uh, an extraordinary, comprehensive, holistic picture of the way that the moon formed and evolved. And, um, and these processes that went on on the moon, they went on in the other terrestrial planets as well. So there are things that we can learn um, about the other planets, the role of impacts and planetary evolution. Uh, for all the terrestrial planets, including Earth, that we will get from studying the moon, where the rec record is so exquisitely preserved. 
So I'll, I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take some questions from you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, my question was, how are your gravimetric readings going to tell you that there is a molten core or what kind it is or whatever? And the other part of my question is, some of the gravimetric blebs that occur near craters uh, as, as has been seen before from orbiters around the moon, how are, they, how are you going to keep them from interfering with your, the data that you obtain in order to discern whether the center of the moon is indeed liquid, solid, solid and liquid? Because it, since it doesn't have a, mag, a, a magnetosphere, there obviously isn't any rotation or any yeah, kind there, of... There isn't a Can you send me that footage right. of so, when I was uh, at so the VAB no. and encountered oh, yeah, Endeavor? Charlie Bolden, I, would love to, I would love to use that in the video. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously I wasn't recording. <laughs> You deliver. I'm just going to give you credit. So, how, are you, how are you going to obtain that information okay. from gravimetric readings? Okay, so. Um, so uh, and prevent any, any errors that might occur from. You know, oh, there's always errors. Okay. <laughs> but we uh, try to minimize them. So, um, let, me, uh, let me explain a little bit how we study the deep interior of a planet um, from gravity. So, um, so, so, if we're studying the gravity of a crater, on the surface, um, the the spacecraft senses it as it comes right over, and it's right okay. But the spacecraft is always being perturbed by the structure of the deep interior. Always being perturbed, okay. And that is, but and it's being perturbed at the longest wavelengths, okay. The little blips are not telling us anything about the core. The whole long wavelength, the integrated of the orbit, tells us. Okay. Now, okay, if circling, correct, so we so that's why we have to keep circling it to get a time series. All right, and um, and uh, and so if the moon were completely uh, uniform and there there was there was no molten material in the inside. Okay. Um, so if the moon were just by itself, the orbit would just be circular. But what's happening? is that the Earth and the Sun are both raising tides on the Moon. Okay? Just like the Moon raises tides in the ocean, well, the Moon raises solid tides on the Earth. The Earth raises solid tides on the Moon. The Sun raises solid tides on the Moon. If there were no molten material in there, um, uh, you would be able to detect that tide okay, as you went over it. But if there is molten material there, there will actually be a lag in the tide. Right, there will be a time varying component, okay, and um, it's extremely subtle, okay, and from so it's a, it, it's basically a phase off that set, okay, and um, and it's the, the imaginary part of uh, of a function for those people who are who are mathematically inclined out there, uh, but by measuring uh, by measuring this uh, time lag, uh, we can tell not only that there's molten material, but we can tell the viscosity contrast between the molten material and the material surrounding it, and that provides us with information on um, on the mechanical structure. And then we don't analyze gravity in isolation because gravity, like magnetics or any other potential, you know, any of you people, his guy, he's ta he's taken physics, he knows this. Uh, potential, any potential field measurement, you can come up with an infinity of solutions that satisfy uh, the gravity field. But, uh, but most of them are not realistic. So the only, the only solutions that you can consider are solutions that have some reality associated with that. So you need to know information on the bulk composition of the moon. Um, you need to know something about the mechanical properties of rocks. So we actually know that you know, the moon, we, we know the melting point of iron as a function of depth and how that varies with pressure. So we can actually use what we learn about the viscosity contrast to make inferences of whether it's uh, 
iron or some other material mixed with iron or iron from sulfur or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you, can't, you can't uniquely interpret gravity by itself. And that's, that's why I said it's so important to use the other information that you know about the moon, plus you know rock physics information that is uh, uh, made in laboratories. So, so that's the that's about the core thing. And then how how do how is it that the um, the basins uh, don't uh, interfere with that? Well, it's you're looking at a short wavelength signal versus the longer wavelength signal. So what we do is we do time series. You know, we we, we it's not Fourier analysis because it's not a flat plate, but spherical harmonic. Um, analyses, which is you know, basically wavelengths on a sphere, okay, and uh, and that's that's how, how we go long do you think you it'll be going in polar orbit before you get anything? Close well, the, the to full we, we map the moon for three months. We do it for three, three cycles. We do it for three lunar rotation cycles, and our we have simulated uh, so. It, uh, with, you, know, gravity, you don't know what you're going to discover. Whenever you do a planetary mission, you never know what you're going to discover. I always get phone calls from the press. You're, you're getting to your planet, what are you going to discover? And I say, if I knew, I could have said it myself. <laughs> 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 uh, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm going to discover, but I know very well what I can measure. Okay? And, and we need to make excruciatingly detailed corrections on this data. Um, but uh, um, uh, but we, we know what we're going to be able to measure, and we believe that after three mapping cycles, uh, we will have sufficient information to tease out the deep interior structure of the moon. It's very exciting. Oh, was that one just back there? Ken? You know, congratulations on your cost setting measures and uh, making it uh, a value to the American citizens. Okay, can, I, can I just comment on that part first? So, I, I, so we're we're under budget, okay. Um, but uh, I never proposed or implemented this mission to be cheap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My mantra on this mission was low risk implementation. And what I did was I spent a lot of my reserve really early to hit things that bothered me before they became bigger problems. But but yes, we're we're under budget. So thank you. Again, congratulations. <laughs> um, uh, my question relates to the lifespan of Grail. Um, I understand that the the de evolution of Grail is going to occur when it hits the eclipse. Mm -hmm. uh, after three months, is that correct? Is there any chance, or is there a percentage of chance that the trajectory might be salvaged before the eclipse so that we can keep a grail, one of the grails in orbit with its at least six cameras and some measuring device in place after that eclipse occurs? Oh, so, um, okay, so these, these two spacecraft were designed, uh, so in a 55 kilometer um, polar orbit around the moon, um, there are, are solar eclipses every six months that put the spacecraft into shadow for several hours. And, um, and this uh, spacecraft design that we based uh, the Grail spacecraft design on uh, was a uh, 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 Department of Defense spacecraft in geosynchronous orbit. It, it was never designed to last through an eclipse uh, that long, okay? Uh, that said, um, uh, when we, our engineers built those spacecraft. Um, they perform better, okay, than they, they look like it. the measurements of them indicate that they are performing better uh, than the way they designed them because uh, prudent engineering indicates that you put margin in there. So, um, so the, the possibility exists that the spacecraft, that both spacecraft, um, could make it through an eclipse and. Um, and if so, they could keep mapping for a while. But we, so we, but that said, um, I proposed to achieve the science objectives of this investigation in six months, okay, when, when we got to the moon. By next June, my goal was to achieve the science objectives. And, um, and anybody who knows me, uh, when I say I'm gonna do something, uh, I'm gonna do it, okay? And um, so if, if we were going to entertain ideas about keeping the spacecraft possibly operating, um, our team uh, will will okay look for new science that could uh, come out of this. You know, more measurements that, that would provide information that we didn't expect to get as the main objectives of the mission. 
One more question. Hi, thanks for being with us today. Um, everything from the launch window to the type of measurements that the probes can take is extremely precise with this mission. Um, I was hoping that you could speak to the theme of precision uh, in GRAIL and also uh, what two probes allow you to discover that one probe alone would not. Okay, so um, yeah, the, the idea of, of, uh, of precision um, is goes through everything um, that, that we do. So we're, we're threading the needle in terms of being at the moon a certain amount of time. Uh, we need to know the distance between the spacecraft very precisely. We need to know time extremely precisely. And, um, and this idea of um, doing precision measurements, uh, you're gonna find this will be very enabling for other planetary missions that wanna do coordinated observations on other planets. So technologically, we're learning some things here that are, are gonna be helpful. As far as the two spacecraft go, um, you just can't measure the, the backside gravity of the moon without the two spacecraft because you can't directly track back there. So, so you've gotta have them, okay? However, what I will say is that from a technological standpoint with, um, with uh, the things that we've developed in terms of timing distance measurement, um, you don't, you don't have to be measuring gravity to utilize some of these concepts. So one could conceive of, uh, you know, on Mars, surface observations and coordination with a balloon or an orbiter or an airplane, a glider with really big wings for Mars in the atmosphere, um, where you could make these coordinated observations. So the idea, for any of you who are familiar with the Earth science side, you know, the, the, the big rage right now is sensor net networks where you're making lots of different measurements uh, in different places and trying to coordinate them to try to understand temporal change, time of day, season, uh, place, all these things. And, um, and so uh, this possibility now is, uh, is opening up with us uh, for the planets. Thank except Pluto, but now I don't have to. <laughs> and we do have a mission on straight to Pluto. Uh, so the Doppler effect. So the, the spacecraft is orbiting the planet. There's a, a very good quality radio that transmits signal to Earth as it experiences uh, the pulling and pushing from the density variations inside the planet. Uh, that gets reflected as a, a shift in the frequency for the, the Doppler shift. So we have very accurate and precise instrumentation both on board spacecraft and at the ground stations of the Deep Space Network. And we measure the frequency shift work backwards to the proportional gravitational force that has caused that. Turns out, next slide please. Turns out you can do this. 
Okay, so here's uh, another clarifying slide. If you could see it below, is the equation of the potential oh, function yeah. that uh, you would do. That's an equation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Maria was talking about. Uh, so next slide. These are the classical results. Uh, in this case, from the uh, Galilean satellites, the uh, large four moons of Jupiter from the Galileo mission. These results about the bulk interior structure of these uh, bodies was derived from gravity science as well as uh, magnetism, a magnetic field measurement. Because, in, as you know, if there's a liquid layer that causes the creation of a dynamo effect. So uh, we take partial credit for these great discoveries in Europa, in Oceanal Europa, you know about that. And can barely see, uh, Titan, uh, the largest moon of Saturn, recent result in science about the uh, its interior structure and a potential ocean on Titan as well. Next slide. This is another classic result now from Mars. Now, unlike the outer uh, parts of the solar system, Mars had orbiters for a long time. So we can actually get a high resolution gravity field and turn that into a gravity map. And that's what you look at, a map of Mars, but from a gravity point of view. So you can see highs and lows and they don't always correspond to actual topo topographic highs and lows. And why is that? It's because sometimes you could see a mountain in the topography and the images, and you fly a spacecraft over it, and you would expect a high gravity signal, and it turns out there is no gravity signal. That's because the planet had compensated for the weight of this load by either flexing or having a route of lower density such that the net gravitational effect that sense by the spacecraft is zero. But sometimes you actually detect the mountain in the gravity signal. So why sometimes and why not others? That tells us right away something about the age of this creature. Because if this was formed when the planet was still relatively warm and fluid, the compensation would take place. If it was formed after the planet has cooled off and became rigid, it would not compensate over, it would only partially compensate. Sometimes you fly over a flat region, at the topography and images and it's flat and you say sure now when the spacecraft goes by there's not going to be a gravity and there is and that's because there's sometimes subsurface buried material of higher density that is manifested in the gravity signal that you can only probe through the gravity signal because the topography and imagery will not tell you this thing. so obviously the first thing you need to do is correlate the gravity map with a comparable size resolution topography map to, to reach the conclusions I'm talking about. Next slide, please. I can't do this. <laughs> okay, but I think this is basically the same concept uh, where if you fly over a mountain, you may or may not see a signal. If you fly over a uh, flat region, you may or may not see a signal. Okay. So it turns out this classical technique, which is not grim, but it is all introduction. You can apply that everywhere in the solar system except two places. One is Earth, and the other one is the Moon. The case of the Earth is because we're standing on the Earth. And it's difficult to track the spacecraft that's sensing the gravity of the planet you're standing on. So if we move the Deep Space Network to Mars and track them over there, we could do it. But So the Earth uh, science community invented another technique, which we later stole for ground. And that idea is not to track the Doppler shift between one spacecraft and one ground station, but between two spacecraft. And record the information, then tell the error or dump the information there as a digital file. And it worked beautifully for Earth and through the GRACE mission. Uh, interesting thing about the gravity field of Earth is that it is time varying. It changes with time. Anybody know why? Okay. The oceans. the oceans. We got an atmosphere that moves, we got water that moves, aquifers that dry up and move somewhere else. So it's very interesting from a climate point of view to study time variations of gravity around the Earth. In the moon, gravity should not be changing. That'd be a different discovery. So uh, basically, next slide, please. Uh, the GRACE technique, which is now the GRAIL technique, works as follows. You have two spacecraft with a radio link between them that measures the exact 
range or distance and range rate or velocity between the two spacecraft. And we can know this distance, as, as Maria said, down to a micrometer or of the order of the size of a, a blood cell or hair. Very precise measurement over hundreds of kilometers. So as the first, the leading spacecraft flies over a mountain, its gravity will pull on it. That will cause an increase in the uh, separation distance that we detect. We, uh, Stephanie, we may have to kind of cycle through this a little bit. And then as the second spacecraft flies over, it will be accelerated, so the distance will decrease. So they will keep doing the scans, will increase and decrease over and over again throughout the body. And this is just one feature. I'm talking about multiple uh, gravity features, mountains, valleys, basins, and so on. So it's very complicated. So the measurements are not direct at all. Grail, they are in Grail on the stands for recovery. So in fact, to get a gravity map, we have to get all the data, throw it in a blender or a common filter, and then that takes into account the various pictorial analysis of the various features you look at, and then we get that. Back. Okay, let's move on. This is actually Earth as it uh, looks uh, from a gravity point of view. I, there was another file that, that shows the, the water level changes, but it ended up being too big for me to email that presentation. I did that, but look it up. It's on, it's on the net. Next slide, please. So this is one of the images of rail. Uh, so we take the grace technique to Earth. Now, we talked about the reason on Earth, the reason on the moon, Maria already answered, is that it's synchronously long, such that we only see the near side. So this line of sight Doppler from a single spacecraft Earth is going to work beautifully for half the moon. And that we're going to have zero information about the gravity on the far side. So obviously, the uh, this, the grace technique of two spacecraft is the solution, and it, it's going to work beautifully because we've seen it work on, on Earth, a more difficult uh, scenario actually, because on Earth there's an atmosphere that causes drag on the spacecraft, so that's a non-gravitational force that uh, they have to take into account. We have our own set of problems. Next slide. Please. Do you think I'm familiar with them? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the primary link between the two spacecraft is a 32 gigahertz or k band link, and it's a pure sine wave unmodulated. So we're actually not measuring distance from that. We're measuring phase, and we convert that to range and range rate uh, in the post-processing on Earth, not on board the spacecraft. If the, the two spacecraft also exchange timing information, we need to know the exact time and the clock drifts of each spacecraft so we can eventually correlate it what we measured with a place on the moon and we know that from orbit by time steps so timing is very critical for the mission then we tell the information to earth uh, the uh, another link and when the two spacecraft are in view of earth we can do additional Doppler tracking by the, yet the third link so it's a very complicated system from a radio point of view very interesting. Okay. Uh, okay, so this was supposed to impress on you the fact that we are so sensitive that even the stuff you take for granted, we consider noise, non gravitational acceleration. By non gravitational acceleration, I mean we are trying to measure gravitational acceleration from the gravity of the moon. So there's additional acceleration from other sources that is a noise source we have to account for, remove, or design the spacecraft such that it is below our noise source. And this one is sunlight, solar radiation pressure. So that actually imparts a force on the spacecraft. So we have to design the optical properties of the spacecraft such that this is not a big problem for us. And it helps that it is a small spacecraft to start with. Other noise sources are the reflection of sunlight from the lunar surface itself, the outgassing of the spacecraft, the infrared radiation from the spacecraft, infrared radiation from the moon in the dark, so it's a whole set, it's a big error budget, and we kind of nail down each one. Um, Mike, we nearly done with the Okay, that's fine. So this is what we do with the data once we get them. We get the gravity field of the moon like in the upper panel. Uh, and this is real gravity uh, data from the lunar prospector. So we already have half the moon, like I said, on the near side. 
and we uh, correlate that with topography, and we as of today have a very high resolution topography field from the altimetry from the new process over there. And it, it just happened that uh, Mary Zuber is uh, the uh, investigator of that altimeter instrument. Uh, I always use this to show this mask on idea, but it's going to be difficult to, to see. But if you look at the upper panel, there are three red circles on this side. These are gravity high. Red is high, blue is low. So if you fly over the moon, you see a screening gravity signal. You look at the topography, and there are two or three blue circles. Blue is low. So you got low topography, yet very high gravity signal. So that's, again, the principle. This was, was discovered in the 60s. Mass cons, mass concentrations, or subsurface high density material that is not detectable except by this thing. So from the, from the correlation, we get into the science products, the thickness of the crust, the thickness of the mantle, the densities of both, and then the presence, potential presence of a solid core, a liquid or fluid layer around it, and so on. And as Maria said, there's this non-uniqueness problem with gravity. You can have a signal, you can have a number, but various scenarios that could lead to that. So we need eventually additional information, some geophysics, some composition of material from other sources always in. Next slide, please. Okay, Mary already spoke about this. This was gonna be the transitional slide when she comes in and talks about the interior structure. So uh, I'll just uh, stop here because we're so far behind. We can take some questions. Um, I just have a question about the placement of the two spacecraft in orbit around the moon. It took man three days to get there, but you guys are taking a little longer going out to find a little garage. Right? The, the scenic crew. Yep. <laughs> <And> <laughs> does that have anything to do with the difficulty of placing two spacecrafts in orbit simultaneously? And so how are you going to get them in orbit and lined up? How are they going to come into the moon? Good question. In fact, I have a video that shows that, but there's no point in showing it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tweet it out later. If you go to the grail.ns and I've got a website, uh, the videos are there. Now the reason, we're, we, we call this a low energy uh, trajectory. And it's basically a cost saving measure. To go faster to the moon, you need a bigger rocket, so that's more expensive. Not only that, if you go fast, once you arrive at the moon, you need to slow down, you need to break to do the lunar orbit insertion, so you need to carry additional fuel on board the two spacecraft to thrust and slow down. So why worry about it? what's the rush? So we just take our time, uh, save money. It turns out there are additional benefits. It gives the mission designers a lot more flexibility. Now we can arrive and do orbit insertion for one spacecraft on New Year's Eve and the second one 24 hours later, New Year's Day, regardless of the launch date. Just if the day, the week, we still have that flexibility. There's other additional science you know, scientific benefits, or at least engineering benefits, it gives the spacecraft more time to outgas before it gets to lunar orbit, where the measuring forces are acting on it. And uh, additional things like the clocks take their time to drift and stabilize, and, and the operations team can have more time learning to operate the mission. Yeah, Any more questions? I do have one, one more comment, unless there's a question. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, while, while you, you... All right. Can we park the satellites at, at the Lagrange points in, uh, before sending them to the moon? Um, no, uh, we, we, we use the Lagrange point as a, as a stopping point or a turning point, but we don't park there. We don't spend time there. We can <laughs> continue. Just kind of circle around and then... Exactly. Exactly. Now, relevant to the question that was asked to Maria about the uh, detecting the core and, and maybe the crater, the, the high wavelength, uh, high frequency, short wavelength uh, features becoming noise to the core detection, we actually tune our measurements. We can tune the, the in, in experiment for the core or for small features. And the way we do that is that we, if we shorten the separation between the two spacecraft, we're very sensitive to small features, small craters, small mountains. We increase the separation between the two spacecraft, 
we become more sensitive to the global type of features such as the fog. But it turns out if you increase the distance between them, we have to elevate the altitude and uh, as in order to prevent reflection of the radio signal off the surface or multi-band. So we start low and close, and we increase and elevate, and we go back low and close to each other. So we get uh, you know, the different parts of the spectrum of, of the craggy field. Okay? Oh. Okay. Can we make this last question? I know you wanted to add something else, Sandy, so. I, I do that just then. Then. Okay, great. But the, if this is quick. Um, did you come up with that equation at the beginning, that like huge equation? <laughs> no. <laughs> that probably goes back to Isaac Newton. Um, what was that again? The, the graph. No, it's just this long equation. Sign it right now. <laughs> U, U equals that to kernel of GM over R squared plus. No, it wasn't that. It was a lot of trick points. Yes, yeah, that's the one. That, that is a classic uh, equation that goes back to uh, when the apple fell on Isaac. Jamie, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>